Uh, thank you, Barrett. Did I, did I pronounce it correctly? I, I was practicing my Norwegian accent, trust me. Um, well, thank you for coming. Um, deeply appreciate the opportunity to, to share the work with you today. Um, and um, one thing I always say in theater is you have other places to be now, but you choose to be here. So I don't take that for granted. So thank you. And for those that are on Zoom, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, deeply appreciate the opportunity. Whatever you're dialing in, I hope that you can hear me uh, and then let's, let's get on the ride together. So uh, I'd like to, um, first of all, uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, and of course, thanks to the Becca, thanks to Bear Rat, and thanks to Ingrid. Uh, of course, to both universities, um, VID and the University of Stavanger. Uh, for the opportunity to, to share my work and my research with all of you. Um, it was really a great opportunity to meet Bebeka's research group yesterday. We had a great time, chatted, and, and I get to hear the kind of work that they are doing, uh, particularly around inclusive theater, and that some of them are actually heading to Iceland. Maybe they're on their way right now. Um, really, um, um, and, and this morning when Ingrid and I were coming here, we actually saw these two youngsters who were um, really at the forefront of ecological protest. And, and really, and I'm saying it's really interesting that we're thinking globally and we're really acting locally and personally. And that's really the hope. Um, so my generation, I'm really hopeful that we're taking on these big ideas and really thinking about them across spaces. Uh, um, Ingrid has really graciously pampered me um, since I arrived, she drove me around, went to the beach, and really, really giving me the opportunity to see different sites in the, con um, in, in the city. So thank you. I um, also want to say thank you to University of Regina, and I'm going to speak more about my university at some point. Uh, my university is in a, um, in a city called Regina. It's in a province called Saskatchewan. It's in the middle of the country, and it's in a region called Prairies. Um, and it's lo located on the territories of the Anishinaabeg, uh, Anish, uh, Nahiyawak, Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Mestiz and the Mischief Nation. That's important to put that to, at the front because of all the conversation around indigeneity and around um, working together to really speak to powers that have dominated and silenced cultures across different spaces. Um, so the, the, and of course, I mean, a department called Department of Theater, Faculty of Media, Art and Performance, uh, and that's where my center, Centers for Socially Engaged Theater, is situated. And I'll speak more about that. What I'm going to be talking about today is, is um, titled Applied Theater and Democratic Principles, a discussion on participation as a tool in promoting well-being in community. Uh, we're going to have a lot of time to, to talk. It's not going to be one way. Um, we're going to really have questions and happy to chat. Um, with everyone. I'm also I'm what is called Canada Research in Social Language Theater, and I'm a director of the center called Center for Social Language Theater, where we do a lot of our work. So this presentation today, it really aims to share some thinking on participation and its implication on theater as a methodology in addressing issues of democracy, uh, justice, inclusive learning, well-being, and of course, I'm gonna be introducing and sharing some of the work that we do at the Center for Social Language Theater at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. So my, my presentation today is really an invitation to rethink the idea of participation. I'll, I'm gonna get more into that. My outline really is, is, is really, I'm gonna give an overview of the theoretical underpinnings on participation and theater. Because um, there's a lot of work also happening both here present in the room and, and those on Zoom and even those that are not here that are working at the intersection of participatory art, sort of using participation as not just only as a conceptual framework, but as a methodology to develop, whether in education, in art, and all of that. I think there's, there's this interesting consciousness around working with 
working alongside, working together with the community and, and all of that. So I'm going to be using two, two case studies to highlight, you know, as it, you know, from my work. Um, and then I'll talk about CSET and then I'll open things up to question and answer. So that's kind of the roadmap. I love to give roadmaps so that we were clear of what I'm trying to do in case I get lost. Um, or I get lost, you get lost, or we're just all modeled in the inning. We have a clear line of what we're trying to do. So uh, when I did my PhD, um, I was really interested in participation. Uh, and particularly that's because I'm coming from, I'm from Nigeria, uh, and, and I'm, I'll speak, to speak more to that in my, you know, as, as I go further. And so I, I started really thinking around the idea of participation and ended up doing my PhD on that. So I'm at that point now where I'm taking that idea and, and I've developed sort of like a framework around that. So I'm sort of subverting the idea of participation, which I'll, I'll give you a little snippet into that. So the presentation today is really an invitation to rethink the idea of participation as a democratic value um, in the society. And of course, by extension in theater, for the purpose of regaining theater's potency to foster change across different social contexts. And I understand that for you, you know, as researchers that you're listening to me, you're here, you have various contexts that you're working. So what I'd like you to do is just go on the journey with me and think about how how you are engaging with participation or how you can engage with participation, how you have engaged with it. By theater, I, I mean an artistic and creative expression of, of the performing arts. Um, the focus of this conversation today is not to define what theater is or what theater is not. I think that's another, that would be another talk entirely. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, um, the kind of theater I'm referring to goes by different names. Um, applied theater, theater for social change, theater for social transformation, community theater, and, in, and, and, in, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Regardless of the nomenclature or regardless of the name or the term we call it, this type of theater uses theater and drama skills for the purposes of teaching, researching, bringing about personal and social change and building a sense of community. So it's about using drama skills, movement, dance, at times music, play, and all of that. For what the purpose is to bring about consciousness, first at the personal level, and then hopefully at the systemic and the structural level. Um, and of course, in that process, build a sense of community. So when we take theater to school, for example, we the times we call that theater in education or drama in education, we take theater to prison, we call that prison theater. We go to um, senior homes. I hope you have senior homes here in Norway. Okay, it sounds like similar, <laughs> similar system. Um, we call reminiscence theater. We take theater to senior people, um, to their homes and to talk about their experience and share their story. So it's, it's the theater that is very public facing and a theater that kind of uses those drama skills and tools to use storytelling, image theater and all of that. So as an, affect, um, as an affective art form, theater engages storytelling, games, exercises, techniques, and a process-driven approach to build empathy and create what is called a democratic space for citizens to emerge in a healthy and inclusive society. It uses different methodologies such as playback theater, theater of the oppressed, which I think many persons would have heard about. It's like one of the most common ones. Improv, improvisation, devising or collective performance creation, uh, reflective processing. And, and I just learned from Ingrid um, about what is called social presencing theater, which is interesting in terms of its own methodology and all of that. And so the idea is, you see, it's on and on and on and on and on and on. And that's why at times if we go to the rabbit hole of what it is, what it is not, we end up doing nothing. So, so as a way to, um, as a way to provide you with context, because I, I believe context is everything. Um, I'm sort of presenting uh, this talk in Norway. Uh, it's in the Scandinavian, it's in Europe, and I'm coming from Canada, 
but I'm also from Nigeria. See, context is very important. So I am from Nigeria. Like I mentioned, I live in Regina, Saskatchewan in Canada. My initial training and exposure to theater was within the context of development, a field that we refer to as theater for development. See, in, a, in a developing country like Canada, like Nigeria, where I was born, it means that many development projects came to us from international communities. Uh, for instance, international, different international development agencies um, champion public health initiatives such as HIV, breastfeeding, democracy, election in the country. But what that meant though is that those agenda were set already. We didn't have a say. So somebody just parachuted, just coming to the country. Hey, you need pub, you need water here. Okay, come together, let's dig water for you. It was from the idea of development. All right. So for those that are in the field of international development or, the, or political science and all of that, you may be familiar with this. They just go there and just do things and all that. But that, that's how my training started. Um, and there was a lot of projects around the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, uh, which later turned to SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And so part of the project that I'm working on right now, we're putting a book together, which Vibeke is contributing to a chapter in that, um, is on theater, applied theater, and sustainable development goals. We want to see what's the connection and what kind of projects, you know, is happening in that and the past, the present, and of course, to look into the future. So an example, um, I was part of a project, a community theater health-based project called School Connect. Um, this project was already determined by the funding partners. Um, so the theater artists that um, participated in the project were called upon to use theater, uh, theater, the instrument of theater to create awareness around HIV AIDS. And I've written about this already. I'm not going to bore you with that project, but they, I'm using that as an example to say that's the kind of background that I'm coming from, that I started from. So as, as participants in such projects, we did not have a say in the thematic direction, in the processes, and even in the methods. Although international organizations tend to look at partners, mostly scholars and academics, this does not necessarily mean the process of engagement was democratic. Um, the political realities of the selection process and the over-centralization of the academy, um, but particularly the education institution, in such projects continue to, to have ripple effect and on the project design, the execution, and of course, the evaluation. A lot of the time we have this idea that scholars and researchers, they have all the knowledge. No, I'm sorry, I'm a scholar, I'm a researcher, but we don't. Um, and so a lot of the time, the over the over-centralization, the there's this exorcism that we have for academia. And then when projects want to happen, we just go to them. They are the go-to. But really, the knowledge doesn't sit with them most time. It sits with the community. So in addition, to, in, in, addition in the big to involve the broader community, um, who sometimes we refer to them as subject of the project. We don't use that term again because it's very derogatory. They are not subject. They are actually the owner of the knowledge. And there's a lot of literature around knowledge production and all of that. So if anybody's in, interested, happy to talk about that. Many, many partners always look for ways to engage the community. Therefore, they go to art. They go to theater as tools for community engagement, for participation, for development, communication, and for learning. And we sort of kind of put a lot of responsibility on theater. Like, you know, there's a time when I'm writing, I, I, I love visualizing, I'm, and I'm thinking, imagine theater is a horse or a camel or a donkey. The kind of load we put on it, it's not gonna work. Like we think it can do education, it can do communication, it can do community engagement, it can do this, it can do this. I'm like, really? You know, it's just a whole lot of, but that's what we claim it does, okay? So the over-instrumentalization of the art did not necessarily create the opportunity for researchers and organizations and agencies to actually consider art as an essential part of the creation. A lot of the time, art is not part of the creation itself, it's mostly part of the dissemination. So when we're thinking about theater and art, many times, it's like we've done the project already, who cares? Now, how do we get it to the people? So we end up coming to theater to say, okay, maybe when we use theater, they will understand. And so 
But what happened to the point of conceptualization, creation, design, execution, we don't use art at that level. We don't. And then we now come to dissemination. Uh, and that's when you, we use it. We can start seeing, I'm trying to tease that out to see, basically start seeing where the challenge is when we over-instrumentalize art and theater. Mm. So within this context, storytelling is always engaged to educate the people. And most of the time, again, it's top-down approach. And in the process, we, we anticipate it foster participation. So in essence, the principle of participation is considered important at these different levels uh, of, of the various projects I've been part of, whether as a participant, as a facilitator, or as a lead or co-lead, or the ones that I've read about. So whether premeditated or agenda-driven project, most of the project want the people who are quote and unquote the beneficiary of the project to participate. In the context of developed country like Canada, where I am right now, um, the rationale for appropriating theater is still the same, even though the processes and the approach and context may be different. And for those that are using that here in Norway, just think about that also. It's always the same argument, even though our context may be different, we're still engaging it in that sense. It's like we're using theater, we're using art and all of that. It's still the same, the same idea why we're appropriating it, appropriating it, even though the context is different. So, um, so if participation is crucial to achieving collective decision-making and creating the future that belongs to all of us, then what type of participation do we want? In fact, is participation enough? Um, using a reflective practitioner methodology in this presentation, I, I explore ways theater, applied theater can amplify democratic principles and in the process promote the well being of society. Um, so, for, for those that are very researchy, that you need a research question, I'll give you. Um, I've had a presentation where I didn't talk about research question. Hey, research question is missing. So, here goes the research question um, How can we create healthy and democratic communities through? apply theater or theater or whatever you want to put that there. Um, in what ways can citizens, um, citizens emancipatory and participatory engagement foster communities well-being? So I'm going to be drawing on two examples from my project, one from Nigeria and then of course uh, one from Canada. So the concept of participation is intrinsically linked to the notion of agency, power, and social change. And so whether you're talking about democracy or you're talking about inclusive lifestyle or you're talking about well-being, what we part of the argument is that it has to be holistic. We can't talk about health without talking about politics. We can't talk about well-being without talking about ecology. So it's, it's the idea of intersectionality, the idea that all these things are connected. So I'm doing a project right now on um, health, art, art, health, and well-being. Um, and I'm also doing a project around policing. And what we realize is that when we're talking about policing, um, we can't but not talk about the social dimension of policy, of, of the social dimension of policy, the, the health implication, the culture, the, and, and all of those things. So at the heart of that is the power, the agency, you know, and, and of course, social change. In his essay on the shore of politics, Jacques Rancier outlines two schools of thought on participation. The first one he called the reformist and the second one he called the revolutionary. And, and that book is written in 1995 for those that want it. Um, it's called On the Shore of Politics. See, the reformist school of thought um, on participation considers as a mediation between the center and the periphery. It's, it's the fact that with participation, you have the center, the power, 
the system and you have those on the periphery or what bell hooks uh, would call those at the margin. So participation is sort of like in between, trying to build a bridge between both of them. Um, scholars who lean toward the reformist idea consider participation in participatory democracy as tyrannical and repressive, and it is still used to silence those on the margin to maintain the status quo. So the argument of the reformist is that participation has been instrumentalized, basically, that in the bid to silence the other, the people, the community, we're using participation as a disguise. So like, we're coming to this space to work with community. Oh, what do you want us to talk about? Oh yeah, they've participated. Oh, I heard about them and, and that's it. And so the reform is of the notion that it's been instrumentalized basically. And a lot of school of, there are a lot of scholars around that. So Bell Hooks is an example, Ed Swarth, uh, Ramena, Kukan, Kothari, um, are examples of those that part of, of those that believe in that. The revolutionary, however, believe that participation is a permanent inclusion of the grassroots community in development processes to reduce uh, power imbalances and inequalities experienced by the masses as the state decides and define issues that concern the people. So the revolutionary believe that participation is important even though it's instrumentalized, but the purpose is to create an, what is called an egalitarian or, or an equitable society. So in Rancière's word in, 2000, in 1995, it is the quote unquote, permanent involvement of citizen subjects in every domain. So to the revolutionaries, participation becomes instrumental it's a tool to give voice to the unheard and to empower the people. Now, dating itself can be very problematic, and I'm not gonna. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go into 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 really unpacking this. We only have a few minutes, but the fact that you are giving voice to someone in itself is problematic because people have voice. You may amplify the voice, but that you are giving them voice. Now you're not. You're not giving anyone voice. You're amplifying the voice, yes, but that you are giving them voice. That in itself is a savior mentality. It's, it's, it's the idea of saviorism. So, and I'm, I'm pointing that out, particularly for scholars and artists and sorry, yeah, artists, researchers, the language of our writing at times can be very, can make us sound like we're like the Lord, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm helping them, you know, I'm giving them voice. I'm, you know, not knowing that, no, you're not giving them voice. You're amplifying the voice. You're creating platform too. We can take that away, but that you are giving them voice, you're empowering them. No, you're not. Um, and, and that's another whole conversation just trying to point that out. So in essence, the, the involvement of the commons in development and, and democratic processes is central to the revolutionary idea of participation. Participation has also been examined through a different lens. For instance, within participatory democracy discourse, there is a call for institutional transformation in which participation becomes a means to create quote unquote democratic space and capability capacities to shift sites and forms of engagement. So Rancière's um, disagrees with minimalist democratic theories, but poses a radical idea on participation that recognizes the fluidity and mobility of power and the need to create a system that will support such dynamism. Beyond political discourse, of course, Rancière's propositions create an opportunity to rethink power and authority in a diverse context, such as the role of learning and teaching, and the need to negotiate the process of interaction and power relations constantly. So it proposes a continual renewal of the actors and the forms of their actions, the ever open possibility of the fresh emergence of this fleeting subject. So in a democratic sense, the intention is proper representation and equitable access. Contrary to this general view of participation, participation also has been described as manipulative. It's been described as Trojan horse, repressive myth, 
tyrannic. It's been described as a thing and, of course, as a jargon. The, the, the complexities of all of this is what we're working in, in theater or act, because we're using a somewhat fraught method or tool to be able to do something hopefully meaningful. So there is a need to rethink that, to reevaluate and to reframe participation to provide a new ways, a new tools to work together in an embodied, in a non-hierarchical but egalitarian, in a non, in a, in a not transactional but relational uh, way, such that creating holistic idea of participation that is responsible, that is reciprocal. And of course, that is people centered. So uh, with all of these ideas around participation, um, all of these sort of fraught and contradictory ideas around participation, what can theater teach us? Because I think that's, that's where my own work come into place. Um, Helen Nicholson, um, um, a professor in, in, in the UK, writes, and I quote, democratic practices that are applied to community and educational settings have always stri uh, striven for inclusivity and equality. And to maintain this commitment to egalitarianism, there is a need to be constantly vigilant about what or who is included and who may be marginalized, silenced, or dispossessed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly just walk you through two projects and I will then come back to discussing what those projects and those ideas of participation came out of that project. Um, this statue is a statue of um, a legend in my culture called Morimi. It's spelled M-O-R-E-M-I. Queen Morimi. Um, a Queen Morimi project was a device theater project held or had it in, in a middle school called Aramiya Middle School in Ife, Ocean State, Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is in West Africa. It has a population of over 200 million people, so it's more than Norway. Um, and there are 36 states, including the FCT the Federal Capital Territory. So uh, I'm in one of the states. Uh, Ocean State is uh, in the Southwest and there are six geopolitical zones in the state, uh, in the country, as a state in the country. So this project happened in Southwest and actually happened in my town called Ife. It, it, it was a project with um, nine grade, um, grade nine students, age 11 to 16, um, 35 of them. Uh, were drawn from four ethnic groups uh, in Nigeria, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, and Ebira. And for those that have Nigerian friends, uh, you've heard about Nigeria, we're all over the place because we're 200, over 200 million. Um, we always hear about Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. So it's like the three predominant um, tribe. I, I disagree. I think every tribe has its own. Uh, but in terms of population, um, we have Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausas. So the Yorubas are on the southwest, the Igbos um, are on the southeast and uh, southeast, and then of course you have the Hausas on the north, well, northwest. And um, anyways, um, I'm just kind of giving you context to just to situate you where where this project is um, happened. The choice of the school was based on the location in a place called Sabo, and in 2017 there was a crisis that happened between the Hausas and the Yorubas. Um, because of how diverse the country is, um, people move around. Like, you know, I did my undergrad, for example, in North Central Joss. Um, somebody has, did, so you can move around the country. And so there are some, when you get to a particular city, there are some areas that is dominated, you know, that um, dominated by people from that particular tribe and they, they just 
they're just there. So this particular place called Sabo in that particular, in Ife, is, it's a place where the houses people really live, the houses and the Fulanis. So there was a crisis between houses and Yorubas. And that's not the first time it happened. Um, and up to now, what caused it is still very controversial. And also how it resolved was very controversial because the power at the federal level, um, the political leader at the federal level is coming from the houser. Um, tribe, it is believed that they silenced that crisis uh, at the detriment of the Yorubas. It's very messy, I'm not going to go into that. But you see the proliferation, um, the, the, the issues around the crises and displacement and all of that. So during that crisis, and I won't give you details, um, because, um, um, just to keep it brief, and also it's, it's also not, I'll just go to the meat of it. During the crisis, of course, school shut down, there were a lot of killings. And think about anything, crisis and all that. Um, so the, the re, it was really, and so when they came back from that crisis, um, it was really important to see it, particularly for some of the students, to sit down and ask ourselves, within the context of our learning, which has its own issues, now we're adding the layer of being, you know, of this crisis, what does that mean for us uh, in our learning process as students? So the project happened over three months, uh, over um, over three weeks uh, for approximately twenty hours in total. Um, and of course, I went to school every morning from nine a.m. to two p.m. Um, um, and all of that. So I ended up designing a drama workshop with the students. Um, uh, on the basis of the story of Moremi. The reason why we, they chose Moremi, I didn't choose it, they chose it. Because in the history of the Yoruba people, the Moremi, um, she used to be a wife of the, of the, of the king as at that time. The Igbo people in history, the Igbo people were always coming to invade the Yoruba people. And so it got to a point that the invasion that this woman, a very courageous said, where I'm not gonna sit down to watch my people being ransacked all the time. And the Igbo people came at a point where they knew that there's harvest, there is something to steal and then they, they invade them. So the king was not doing anything. And so she decided to go into the camp of the enemy to go and sort of spy and then and come back to tell the people the, the secret of the Igbo people and then they used that to fight them. So this story was very interesting on many reasons, on many levels. One is that a lot of the time, uh, when we talk about espionage, this is the classic espionage, by the way, it's not 007. We've had, <laughs> we've had espionage in different cultures. But beyond that, and that's just for me, just you know, a very um, you know, comic level. But the serious thing though, is that a lot of the time we always, overemphasize the role that men are playing in defining culture and defining history. And it was important for those students to say, we're interested in hearing, we've been hearing what men have been doing over the years. Where are we as female? So getting to that class, it was important for them to pick the material we're gonna work with rather than me picking them. And when I was going to to work with them, I had no idea we we're gonna do this. But when I got there, you know, it was it was really interesting that they had that they had that boiling question: What about us, particularly the female? Like I've never heard one of them was saying. I've never heard them talk about the role of women in nation building. And the only thing we're hearing is how men are just building the nation, even though they're destroying the nation and all that, that's a, another story. But anyway, so we ended up picking that story and then just, we did drama drama workshop around that. Just, we, we actually brought her to life, basically. So brought her to life, I mean, we reimagine her. Don't, I'm not, we're not bringing her to life from the dead. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play these audio play that came out of that. Um, uh, the the intro of the audio play is like it's a traditional jingling of so just permit me if it doesn't sound well to your ears just enjoy it um, and then it's just like a minute audio play and 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 I'm also gonna play another video because part of for me 
part of the way I, we end up presenting the performance is not only in the sense of just come and show people, which is great. I also have to think about the longevity of the material because when I present a play to you here, it's very temporal, very ephemeral, but are there other processes, other ways that we can present the materials even after that? So uh, listening to this quickly, it's an interaction between Morimi, we, the students imagine Morimi coming back to life and they were asking her questions, okay? So it's an interaction between Morimi and one of the people in the land when Morimi came back. So, happily. <laughs> Thank you for going to the camp of Igbos for the Ife people. I receive your accolades with gratitude. More me, only nure, your selfless acts save our people. Like other women that have gone before me, I asked myself, what can I do to bring peace to the land of Ileife and to my people? Okay. I was in the palace, but I heard the cry of my people each time the Igbos attacked us. More me, Jasuru. I thought to myself, be a spy, know their secrets, and return to your people with your discovery. And that's exactly what I did. I prayed to Esimeme the goddess, and she helped me throughout my journey. I returned safely to save my people. You are a god among us. Thank you. Did you know? That there are other women who offer themselves for their land. Ah ah ah, rara mo ah more me, oluri ah ah, ah oluri more me. How do you mean? Yes, there are many other women in other villages and settlements who led their people to war. Ah, mo, but we have not heard about them. Well, we have been considered as hidden figures. Hmm. So um, <clears throat> the interaction between Moremi and one of the uh, the people in the land, she was Moremi received of the all the accolade when they were greeting her, well done and all that. And then she said, "No, wait a minute. Yes, I received the accolade, but you have to understand that there are other women like me who have done similar things across their culture and all that." And the, it was the interaction was, "Oh, but we've not heard about them." And she said, "We have we have been considered as hidden figure." That and that was that's one of the reasons why we ended up picking that story because a student wanted to to really unpack that. What does that mean for us, especially for women living, you know, coming up now, you know, growing up in this kind of system now? The second project I'd like to talk about, I'd like to give you a highlight on. It's called the Onion Theater Project, and this is where I need to play this. Let's see. Oh, okay. I forgot this. I might need help here. I need to play this video. Because uh, because this video is on is on YouTube. Um, let's see, just a minute. If I do this, uh, Control C. Sorry, everyone on Zoom. We're just trying to. Huh. No. Yeah, if you go back and just be sure you copy it, yeah, and then I'll copy. I have to copy it, yeah. Why is copy? Uh, if you say take. Sorry, I use Mac, so now I, I yeah. think I forget how to use. <laughs> That's the challenge. It's not Control C. Oh. But is it all? Oh, Okay. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Great. Okay. And then we'll go to. Mm. Yeah. Then. Okay. 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 Or, uh, or reject them. The, Utala, the third one, that one. This one. Yeah. Utala. Okay. Let's go, go. Go, go. Okay. 
We can just put it on bigger, okay? Yes. So the context for this one, so that's Nigeria. This a context for this is it's Canada. It's in a place called Victoria, British Columbia. And so you would see how the context has changed now. So um, just some few minutes. And So the Onion Theatre Project is uh, a, a theatre geared towards exploring immigrant experience from the roots in the city of Victoria. It's, it's a collaboration between uh, Victoria Immigrant Refugee Centre Society, uh, funded by the British Columbia Art Council, and uh, in collaboration with other stakeholders within um, well, our whole process is using the people that are here and, and creating a space for all of our voices to be heard in a unique and different way and that's kind of the heart of doing this kind of community-based uh, practice is that um, we're really just providing a space for, for us to creatively explore you know, this topic and what that means for us. I'm here to defend the individual. I'm here to defend myself. My name is Jasmine. My name is Hannah. I'm helping with the devising by kind of acting as a stage manager as well as I've been doing all the marketing for this project. I am an actor and a ensemble member in this project. I've been here since last year and very excited to be here again. Hi, my name is Sari Alesh. I am from Syria and uh, I'm going to play violin in this play. I'm very excited. So my name is Sylvia and I've started back in May and then I just started with the devising process and as an actor. My name is Tian Xu Zhao and uh, I present myself as an actor and uh, an ensemble member. My name is Serena Martin. Um, I met Taiwo a while back doing a project for the Intercultural Association. Um, and we became friends through that, and then he mentioned this project, um, and so I thought it was really interesting and decided to join in. Uh, my name is Aziza Siri Kalo. I'm 17, recently graduated from Reynolds Secondary, and my part in this play is just spoken word and poetry. It's really interesting to see how stories becomes acting and becomes performance that you can introduce to other people and find connections with uh, people in the community, like immigrants and refugees. But I think it's also just a really important topic and it's a really timely um, subject because it's on World Refugee Day that people can be more aware about like the stories of people that they meet on the street that might be a people of color and they would know more about where the, what their stories could be and where they're coming from. One of the reasons I love about like theater, theater generally, is that it, it has a way of building empathy. So even if you're not an immigrant and you're not a refugee, 
uh, the performance sort of brings you closer to the lived experiences of immigrants, refugees, and even settlers. There are a lot of diverse voices in the group, and I think it's important no matter who you are to come and listen to it and experience it. Shut this. We're gonna go back to this. Okay. <clears throat> so, two different projects, um, two different experiences, one in Nigeria and one in Canada. And I have to say, I think the website for that project, if you go out and things are working, I think we have to resuscitate it. Um, but, you know, want to hear more about the project, I'm happy to talk about, talk about that. Uh, and while you see the second one, those that are actually part of that, the first one you did not. Actually, my wife and I recorded the audio of that first one. Um, um, so in, in devising that project, it was both of them. It was really important to, to bring about, to blend fiction with fact. Um, and that's, that's the process of engaging, we're talking about participation. That's the process, the various levels of engaging them. So we bring fact and fact and fiction together, how to blend that because um, as, a, as, as a way to create those two things, um, those projects. Um, of course, storytelling uh, was very critical. I uh, was very pivotal uh, uh, to the entire process. Um, I'm kind of very culturally um, sensitive uh, um, uh, historical materials um, in terms of, particularly in terms of the first one. Now, the second one, Onion Theater Project, because it was a lot of refugees and international students and newly arrived immigrants um, in, in, in the city of Victoria, we were not necessarily dealing with material, you know, cultural materials, with rather dealing with personal materials, experiences of their sojourn from their country and all of that. We used a lot of image theater. I think some people might have used image theater here. Um, again, because language, English, English, everything has been English five from where I'm coming from. And so we'll, we'll always say that image speaks louder, you know, has, you know, a thousand, it can mean one, one thousand and one things rather than just one word. Um, we use a lot of photography, um, but for the first one, um, I chose not to use any to share any of the any of the images because I don't want to re I don't want to re reinforce the stereotype about Africa culture. Uh, that's an ethical thing. Uh, part of my research is on ethics, so I'm very careful what I what I show, what I don't show. Um, but the but the photograph, uh, the images that came out of the project were very important in ensuring the continuity of that project while working with them, capturing the experiences and also those memories. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna find a lot of my work, and I'm gonna find the video online, and I'm gonna find the photos online. It's, a, it's an ethical choice. And we're gonna come to that when I'm talking about participation. Of course, a lot of games, and I'm gonna run through this, a lot of games, uh, both you know traditional games and different things like that. Um, and of course, music and dance, and a lot of exercises that were very important. Uh, and of course, diversity of language. I spent some time to talk about this. So when I was conceptualizing participation or rethinking what participation is, I came up with these two, two ideas of the noun-oriented idea of participation 
and the verb oriented idea of participation. I've written about it, it's all over the place. It's online, not all over the place, it's online. But my idea is that when we talk about participation, it's always about doing. We wanna do something, we wanna do. So it's very external, it's very action driven, it's very verb. But there's another kind of participation we need to think about, which is understanding that to participate is human. That we have the capacity, everything being equal whether we have the capacity to or not to, whether we have a, a, we, a system that can help us to, everybody wants to have a say in their life. And so what if we're going to community, having that understanding that they have the capacity to participate, even if the system does not make them want to, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's ableism and whatever it is, but are knowing that Every human being has the potential to. Now, what that help, what that changes for us though, is that the idea of going to help people, we realize that we're really not. What we're trying to do is to bring a platform where they can explore and expand and engage with whatever they have. So I developed this, this framework around noun-oriented idea of participation and verb oriented idea of participation. But when we now bring both of them together, so from the external to action focus to two plus a means to an end, and of course, very project agenda driven and all of that to the human attributes to the state of becoming internally driven and people centered. When we bring both of them together, I, we have to bring both together because we need the verb, which is like the leg to do the work. But then we also need the now, knowing that people having a philosophical and ideological understanding that we're not going to help people, rather we're creating a system where they, are, they can thrive. So whether we're working within the discourse of participatory democracy, or working with social justice or with health and all of that, the, because we are working with somebody, we're working with community, having that understanding then helps us to know that, A, this is a process. It's about understanding the other. It's about introducing what, I'm, what I've designed here around the dignity of you as a person, knowing that the system may be different in terms of you know, injustices and all of that, but those systems are inhibiting you as a person to be able to do the work you're meant to do or to live to the fullest you want to. It gives the power back to the people rather than making me as the researcher or on this other end to feel like I'm going to help them. But this thinking also helps to build that empathy. It helps to be able to help us to hopefully get into the shoe of the other. It also gives that sense of responsibility that, that we're, we're, whether passively or actively part of the process of whatever system we find ourselves. So we're, we're all in this all together. And then with that also comes that idea of respect, that I have respect for you. I may, I may have a position of privilege and I'm coming to work in your community, but that doesn't make you less and that doesn't make me more. And with that then helps to trigger the idea of reciprocity, that if I am able to respect you and dignify you for who you are, using the tool of participation, but knowing that you are a person, not less because you are a female, not less because you are black, not less because you are uh, disabled, not less because, and, and think of every other thing that, that will box people around being less on, but that we think, we see that they're first a human being and we're all meshed in this system. It helps to determine what we want to reciprocate. And then of course, finally, is the idea of relationality. How participation as a tool put us together to relate with one another. And we now have to determine those terms of relationship and engagement. Anyway, so, um, so with the two projects that I've presented, 
I try to work within this framework. Now, doesn't mean I got it 100%, mm-hmm. by no means. But knowing fully well that I'm going into a space and I'm asking the children, what exactly do you want to work on? What are you comfortable working on? Um, when are comfortable with you taking pictures? When I'm going to take pictures, we want to work on more me. We want to, I want to share my story. And then we try to position ourselves in a lot of games and exercises. How do we then do that so that we're accountable first to ourselves and then to the other? But beyond that, though, is that beyond that also is that we always start from the position of me, myself, as a person. Where am I right now? If I'm able to answer that question and explore that question and really position myself, then can we then, then it will help me to position or reposition in connection to us that are in the room. And then we can then make it bigger. What does that mean for us that we're in a system, that we're in a structure and all of that? So, I think, okay. So theater can create a space for collective envisioning by involving the community, whether young stars, adults, seniors, um, regardless of, of the thematic focus. An undemocratic and exclusionary society is unhealthy. So to be democratic is to create a clear path for individuals to be part of a process, a space where people of different and diverse perspectives, experiences, and concerns can share and engage with individuals, systems, and structures. So a broad understanding of participation therefore means that we have to constantly challenge the justice paradigm that we have. We have to consider the social dimensions of human society from health, which is well-being that we talked about, to social connection, to education, and to political and historical realities. And this cannot be duly achieved without involving the people concerned, but not just only involving them, but we want to involve them based on their terms. So through this this kind of intentional involvement in community, um, these ideas can then become holistic so that we can create a future that we want, a future that we imagine. Coming to the end of my presentation, I'm just gonna run through this. I did mention that I'm going to talk about what we do at CSET, Um, but I'll take just one, second pause because that's the end of my pre my plan presentation around participation i'm just going to run through this slide about what we do at CSET. so CSET is the center for the shield and gauge theater i did mention it's at the university of regina um and the objective of CSET at sort of like three levels one is to we lead a, a range of projects that focus on how theater and performance in Saskatchewan is our location uh, and on the prairies is the region and of course beyond that uh, beyond those location interna- national and internationally how that can initiate new dialogues concerning issues of race just like the second project that I presented race relationships social justice like the first one and of course human rights the second thing also is we create innovative artistic programs in social language theater and the last thing is that we we mobilize community ideas that would inform policies to reposition voices on the margin, bringing them to the center of the conversation. In terms of the broad research questions we try to, uh, we try to focus on, um, they're, they're sort of in, in three levels. The first one is we're really interested in how theater can expose in what ways theater can expose power relationships and oppressive practices that have been normalized by the dominant culture. So you hear me talk about human rights, you hear me talk about power, agency, participation, and all of that crazy stuff. It's because this is really at the heart of what we try to do. Um, more specifically though, we're, we're also interested in how can theater create safe and brief spaces to explore systemic racism in the justice system, particularly policing, um, in order to safeguard human rights. Um, and I'll talk about one of our research clusters around policing specifically. But we're really interested in that distinction between the systemic systemic racism and, of course, the justice system. And then, of course, the last one is that we're hoping that by, by posing some of these questions and many more, that we examine how identity, belonging, and membership are negotiated and demonstrate um, 
demonstrate, uh, and demonstrate the most effective ways for anti-racism strategies to be taught and learned through interactive community-based theater practice. So again, uh, the reason I'm making this, kind of sharing this is for us to start thinking what are, what are points of connection and synergies as it were. Uh, so we explore issues of human ecology and art-based and participatory methods from policing to justice to, eco to um, ecology to sustainability to the decolonization it's, it's all of it. um, and more. We build community relationships and um, collaboration with diverse stakeholders across different sectors. And of course, we think globally and act locally and personally. And I was talking that, to, you know, when we earlier on before when we were meeting um, earlier on, um, I was talking about that global thinking um, and, and that acting personally and locally, because I think that's really very important. Um, of course, um, if you kind of allude to my presentation in terms of our strategy uh, of our approach methodology, if you may call it, it's around the idea of praxis, theory, reflection, and action. And I'm not going to talk more about that. Hope, you know, hopefully, if there's questions or we know that already. So um, right now we have five research clusters. Um, there's theater, justice, and policing. Um, there's theater and immigration. Aspect, we're focusing on expectations, belonging and identity, um, creative economy and cultural policy. There's art, health and well-being. And the last one is around decolonization and ethics and sort of like theorizing performance studies. And we've published across all of them. Um, and so the, the center is designed as a research hub to explore issues critical to human ecology, very art-based and, and participatory, very artistic research. Um, it's a link incubator. We connect people and ideas um, across different regions. And it also speaks to my Canada research project, um, Canada, Canada research chair mandate. And of course, it's envisioned as a space, ethical space of possibility. So we kind of drawn both qualitative and quantitative methodologies, more, more qualitative than quantitative. Um, but we also know that qualitative is critical. It's part of it. So we're working on, on, on all of that. Uh, and a um, lot of ongoing project. The website is cset.ca, and all of these things out there. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to say something about this though. Um, the way we consider publication at the center is different from the traditional idea of publication. I love writing. Uh, great, I love it. Um, and it's done. We have a lot of lot of publications, but we're also very interested in accessibility. So we have our podcast. We we do. We do our videos. We do it's it's very art based, so we kind of mix all of that together because it's really very critical in terms of who gain access and who does not. Um, now, chip this in here, um, and I think I was talking to Barrett about uh, Barrett about this. Uh, the the department in theater just launched a, a new devised performance and theater creation program, and that's because again, there's a lot of appetite around creating new works, and so. Um, devising it's becoming a big thing in North America. Well, in Canada, I want to sound like in North America, as if I know everywhere um, in Canada. And so this program is really geared towards really building a holistic theater people. They can create their work, um, devise and, and work and produce and all of that. Uh, and then I'd like to end on this note. I think I've used uh, almost an hour already. This is what wakes me up every morning. Um, when, I, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, it's that my hope is this, that emotions might move us to social action, that empathy might challenge us and enhance our critical thinking capacity so that we can beckon to a future that is characterized by equity. And this is my mantra. This is what I wake up. This is what wakes me up every morning um, because the world is messy but with all these ingredients, I think we'll make it better. End of thought. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm just wondering, um, do you want five minutes before we have Thank you, yeah, discussion? let's do that. Or will that lead us to the people who have left? Maybe we need quite a few minutes with fresh air. Okay? Yeah. 
So then we will uh, see we can have it. We have a we have a couple of uh, questions also on the yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so, okay. so so uh, five minutes just the fresh air and water and what we need to do on the toilet. So uh, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> and then we start. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Just yeah. Yeah. If, if you want to see if can you access the question? Yeah. You the question? Uh, okay. Yeah, you have this wonderful um oh yeah, yeah you can mm, okay. this came when you talked. Okay. So for those on Zoom, we're just taking five minutes break. For those on Zoom, we're taking five minutes break. Can they hear me? Um, and we're, we're going to be back in five minutes just to stretch our legs and all that. So we answer all the questions on Zoom. Um, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great question. Okay. Beautiful. So, do you want me to read it or do you want to sort of just. I can just, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll do that, that. Yeah. I can just sort of yeah. pumping it up. That's okay. right. Thank okay. You. Yeah. But I, I can see, sir, so you can have the. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah.
can use my okay um let's let's try to do this together um so maybe we we'll, we have some questions on zoom already if there are questions in the room maybe we can do one after we can do one in the room and one here and so any question in the room or we can start with the zoom okay so let's start with the zoom so the first and and for those on zoom thank you so much for for staying um, for this Q&A session, deeply appreciate it. Um, so I'm just gonna read the first one. I'm enjoying this presentation as it raises uh, interesting issues around democracy, applied theater and community well-being through the idea of participation. The first question is what are the key cultural and sociopolitical factors that must be taken into account when designing and implementing theater, applied theater interventions that prioritize community participation and promote democratic values, specifically in Nigeria? Uh, I'll try to answer that question, um, but I also said I won't be able to, to do justice to it in just a few minutes. Whether Nigeria or anywhere, when we're going into community to do something, whether it's an intervention or whether it's learning, it's teaching and all of that, I think we have to understand, we have to do our research. It's really important to do our research, both with a text written, published, and with people that are living, <laughs> um, to understand what's the historical realities that we're stepping into. So for Nigeria, for example, the, the example, the project that I talked about, I had to do research, or even though I am from there, so, it's, so I have that, you know, there are many reasons that I didn't have to do because I'm from there, I know what's happening and all that. But we're going, if we're going to a place, I think the first thing is really ensuring that we do the research of understanding the systems and the culture. We understand the history in the past, the political, the culture, the spiritual. Because when we do all of that, we can then, there's some question we can answer, ask ourselves, one, Am I even the right person to be in this space to do this? Because there are times that we're not, we're not the right person to walk in that space. And I'm sorry to say that it's the truth. I know that our, our institution wants us to go out to do things, but we have to ask ourselves, am I the right person to do this? And I'll give an example. In Canada, um, we have a lot of conversation around indigenous indigeneity and, and all of that. And so when you're working in that community, it's very important. Is this my story to tell? Am I the one that is meant to lead this project? Am I the one that is meant to facilitate this? When we, when we have that understanding of the system, of the culture, the political, the historical, and all of that, we can then position ourselves, what role can I play here? So there are some projects that the only role I play was just to facilitate the conversation and I'm out of the place. There's some times that I'll take the lead. There's some times that my role is just to help write that grant and then I'm out of here. So I think for me, those are very key questions to us. So for, uh, for the person that asked that question, um, and that it's Dr. Regemore Moren Zedgedze. I hope I answered that question, uh, pronounced that name correctly. These are a lot of factors we then need to consider, uh, whether past history or currently happening. If I'm doing a project in Nigeria right now, there is no way I'm going to do a project in Nigeria right now, and I'm not going to consider the ongoing political situation, and I'm not going to consider end SAS, and I'm not going to consider every other thing. So it's the same, whether in Nigeria or other places, we need to do those research and ask those questions, because there's some culture that I've, um, part, of, part of my research is around ethics. Um, and when we want to be ethical, it means that we're ready to be vulnerable. It means that we're ready to ask ourselves some tough questions. And so when we're going to a community, these are, these are cultural, sociopolitical factors we have to consider. Uh, and, and it speaks to remuneration. It speaks to consent. It speaks to who is in charge. It speaks to methodology. It speaks to everything, right? Because the moment we're able to ask those questions, then we can know 
what we need to do, what we don't need to do, where we need to be quiet, where we need to leave this in and all of that. So I do hope that I speak to that. Um, and, and in the case of Nigeria, it's, it's very peculiar because like I said, it's about 200 million people. It also depends on where you're doing that project and all that. But for me, these pillars are very critical in regardless of the, con of the system and the culture you're working. The next question, what are the potential ethical considerations that must be taken into account when using applied theater as a tool for promoting well-being and democratic values within Nigerian communities? And how can these considerations be effectively addressed? These are really big questions. Um, I'll, try to do, I'll try to just speak to that. Um, there are a lot of ethical issues that has to be considered. And I'm, again, I'm trying to take this beyond just Nigeria. Um, for me, the question of ethics is not a morality debate. It is a political debate, and I've written about that. Ethics is not, if I'm saying, uh, part of my argument is that we need to turn from a morality debate to an ethical, to a political debate, a social justice debate. Because when I come to your space, I want to work with you, Beret, and I come to your space, and you're in a culture where it's been marginalized for a very long time, and I come with a, a piece of paper and I say, sign it, you're handing power over to me because I can do anything with whatever information you give me. That's what we call giving consent. But I work in cultures where you don't give consent, you earn consent. That means that I have to live with you in your environment for X number of months or X number of days, and you have to see me fit to be able to co-share this knowledge that you have with me. You see, it changes the dynamic. So the first thing for me is power. At the heart, whether you are a professor, you are a student, whether you are uh, a public health practitioner, whether you work with people with disability, whether you work in whatever, is at the heart, it's power. So the first, you know, potential ethical consideration that need to that we need to talk about in the room is power. Who has the power? Who decides what is done, what is not done? Who decides where to publish? Who decides how to publish? Who decides what to give, the money to give, the money not to give? It's power. Now, whatever way it comes out, it's different for different people. For some people, it's about knowledge production with the indigenous community, and I'm using that as an example. For some people, it's about um, the economy of it. For some people, it's about the political realities of it, but at the heart of it is power. So when I'm going to community, the first question I'm asking myself as an ethical consideration is who has the power, who does not have it? Because once we take that out, then we can, we can then talk. Okay, so, um, and I'm sorry, I'm going back to some of the things that I've written. My apologies, I don't mean to put myself here. Um, I wrote a paper that I called Ethical Questioning, um, um, Ethical Questioning. And I've sort of identified some couple of big areas that you have to ask yourself questions when you're working in community, from power to privilege. You have to know yourself first. You can't give what you don't have. My parent taught me that, you cannot. You can't invent what you don't, you, you can't give rather what you don't have. It doesn't work like that. And we have a mishmash in our society where we don't have something, we pretend we have it. And that's where performance comes to be. We have a lot of organizations that are trying to push equity agenda. I don't know about Norway. In a lot of North America, many organizations are trying to say, yeah, we're equitable. And they, have, they are performing it because they don't have it. And it's the same for academics and anywhere we're working. So the first thing first, then I kind of identify those key areas of where we need to ask ourselves that ethical questioning. Um, so it's, I call it ethical questioning. So ask yourself that question, and which goes back to that question. Me in the, pos in the room, what's my position? What power do I hold? What privilege do I hold? Who am I silencing? Um, what do I bring the knowledge of the people into the conversation? Do I bring it in a respectful way or am I appropriating it? Because there are two different things, right? And different things. Like. So to answer that question, I think that these are, uh, these are questions to ask. Um, these are considerations ethically to consider whether we're working in Nigeria or not in Nigeria. There's another question, but I want to come to 
any question in the room? Um, we have more question coming. Um, uh, I'm gonna, there's a question. Uh, uh, any question in the room? If I go back to the Zoom, yeah. Not yet, okay, we're thinking about it. So I'm gonna go back to Zoom. Um, how can applied theater intervention be adapted and tailored to meet the specific needs, specific needs and challenges of diverse Nigerian communities, particularly those that are marginalized and underserved? Um, this person keeps asking questions about Nigeria, which is, I think we should talk um, because when we see Nigeria, it's also very blanket. We have the issues happening in the North is different from the issues in South South. So at times when we blanket everything also is different. Uh, so maybe, and I'll, I'll give an example. When we go to South South, the South South part of the country, that's where oil was discovered in 1959 in a place called Loibiri. Um, and the moment oil was discovered, and then we have big corporations like Shell, Chevron, and all that moved into the country, just like you have Equinox here, we have Shell and the rest. What happened though, is that with the resources, that resource become or became the main um, revenue generation for the country. But the issue of eco, eco, ecology, the issue of sustainability, climate change, and all of that, it's so drastic in South South because that's where all the mining, majority of the mining happens. So their water, aquatic life, all dead, and all of that. And then the money is taken and taken to other part of the country to build other part of the country. So when you go to the north, for example, there's so much around you've heard about Boko Haram and all of that. When you go to South, so when we also blanket Nigeria, it's also winning. And that's what I'm saying is that with, with, it's important that yes, as a nation, we have, we have issues we need to deal with, but we have to contextualize it. But at the heart of the contextualization is that we, it's important to ask ourselves all of these questions that even though the context is different, when we come to work in community, we can still engage those questions to help us. We can still talk about what's the history in this place? Who holds the power in this place? What's the politics and the politics in this place? How does things work? Because the way things work in the Northern part of the country may be different from the way things work in the southern part of the country, even though we still have sort of like a national culture. So I hope that kind of give concern. So how can applied theater intervention be adapted and tailored to meet the specific needs and challenges of diverse Nigerian communities, particularly those that are marginalized and underserved? My response to this is it can, but we have to allow the people to take the lead. Um, I, I try not to walk in this interventionist sense of wanting to fix things. There are some situations, some issues that applied theater cannot solve. Let's be realistic. There's some that it can. So depending on the community, that's what I'm saying, maybe I need to chat with this person. Depending on, the, on what is happening in that community, we can see what are those things that applied theater can help, can support in achieving what are those things that it cannot. So I'll give an example. The recent issue that happened in Turkey, someone sounds like is on Nigeria does not have all the problem in the world. There are a lot of problems that we all share problem. The situation that happened in Turkey, for example, a few weeks ago, almost a month now, did you hear about that? The, the, yeah. The first thing that people talked about, which was really amazing, was how do we how do we not just really evacuate people out, but how can we start supplying? It was it was a humanitarian need immediately. How do we get money there? How do we do all of that? I'm not going to go take theater there and say, let's do theater because the human needs need to be done. A few weeks later, we have the issue in Sudan. It's not about taking theater to go and talk about crisis because that's not what they need now. It's about how do we evacuate people out of Khartoum? How do we send them to the neighboring countries in Egypt? How do we send them out? If we come to Ukraine, it's not about taking theater to the people. We have to understand what time do we take theater? What, at what point do we need it? Because there are times that we don't need you 
to come and teach us to dance. Mm -mm. Right now, we need practical needs. So that's why at times I try to move away from the interventionist. You know, we need to ask the people, A, is it the time? B, how can we, what it, what, once we identify that, then we can say they can identify, again, going back to participation, what do you need? What, what do you need us to support? work together for rather than having an agenda because the reality is that once we have a set agenda that is not designed by the people we have the tendency to go wrong because then we're prescribing to them so that's why this question um i think it can it can it also may not depending on where things are at and and all of that um, with another question, given your experience in both Nigeria and Canada, how can technology be leveraged to support participation and engagement within communities? And what are the potential risks and challenges associated with this approach? I think technology has been used already. Um, it, it has its, it's, it's, it's like a, a Janos, you know, face, two face, right? Like a coin, two sides. Um, technology can, and, and we've seen people doing WhatsApp drama in South Africa, for example, people doing Telegram drama, like in Iran, I was in Iran doing some, you know, working in Iran some couple of years ago, you know, really finding ways to beat the system, TikTok and all of that. So technology has been, continued to be an important instrument to foster, to foster participation, engagement and collaboration. However, though, we have to also be careful because, again, everything has multiple sides to it. With technology also come the question of who is left out, who is left in, because there are some spaces that technology is not necessarily accessible. So the, the piece around um, technology is important. We have to wrap it into what we're doing, but we have to also say, you know, let's constantly go back to it and ask those questions around access, power, and all of those things. And this is the reason. Whatever you put on any of those technological softwares and all that, where does it go to? Who has it? Who has the data? And all of that. So those are bigger questions, of course. It's not for us to, we can solve that now. Um, but those are, it's good for us to be aware of that so that we can, let's leverage it. But I do agree we can leverage it. Uh, I understand you underscore the imperativeness of power and con conceptualizing participation. How can participatory approaches be used to address power imbalances within communities and promote more equitable participation? I think an effective, an effective participation is the one that takes into consideration all that I'm saying, that it's not just enough to just come and just say, yes, we heard people's voice, um, the so what question. So when I'm talking about participation, I'm working in my own practice, I'm always thinking about so what. So the project that I showed you, the second project, it was very intentional, very strategic, and I try to be, and not all the time, because uh, they don't have the resources and all of that, they don't have the time. But I took that plate to the city hall. I needed the, the mayor of my city at that time to see it. I needed some policymakers to see it. Like I literally took it to their doorstep. Like, hey, look at it. This is what immigrants are saying. This is what international students are saying. This is what newly arrived youth are saying. Why? Because even though they've participated, they've shared their perspective, it's going to die on that front if it doesn't go to the people that you need to go to. So we need to think beyond just sit in the space, create a performance, rehearsal, and that's it. It's more. And that's something that applied theater, we need, to, we need to know our limitation or whether theater, whatever name we call it, whatever methodology we're using, we, we need to know our limitation. And how can we connect with other, other you know, spaces to be able to make whatever we're doing effective? Um, you know, that project, I, I worked with service agency who are, you know, into working with immigrants and all of that. So that, again, the essence of that project can outlive us. Not necessarily, we're not, we're not putting up any policy on anything, but we're bringing in those people that can learn from that and hopefully that can inform whatever they're doing. So that for me, um, the, the, my response to this question is that participatory approaches are very important, but I ask myself who is at the table. 
Because if we're making a, if we're making a piece about, and I'm going to give an example of Equinox, for example, because I just heard about it today, which is very fascinating uh, for me hearing about it because I was telling everyone that I find hope in that, that the, the, the young generation, my generation, was really, were really full on an advocacy to say, we were really thinking about our future and future of our children and all of that. But if I'm putting a performance around ecology, ecosystem, climate change, and all of that, and the only people I have in my room are just, you know, five to four year old, it's great. I want them to know. But what if I have five year old, I have professors, I have people that also have the power beyond, you know, again, it wasn't what I want to achieve, obviously. But, but I'm, and, and my example is not apt. But my point, though, is I'm asking myself who is at the table that can help us do that we can work together to achieve whatever participatory approaches can has brought to us. I'll give an example. I'm doing a project right now with other collaborators across the country. It's about using strategic foresight, future thinking, redesigning and thinking about the future of theater sector, art and you know, theater sector on the prairies. Uh, and where am I going with this? Uh, just give me a minute to get my thought together. Um, hmm. So we were, we were, when we, when we, when we came to do that project, and the project is still ongoing. One of the questions that when I started it, one of the questions that I did ask myself is, what do I really want to achieve with this project? Of course, I had to do a lot of consultations and all of that. But one of the, the major issues that I came up with was that people were telling me, what you're doing is not new. People have asked us what we want. We've told them, but we've not seen any change. That is the backlash of participation and participatory approaches, especially when it's, when it's dead end. Because when you go back to the same people over and over again, tell me what you want, and then they tell you, and then but nothing changes. And that's why I'm always saying participatory approaches are important. They are great, but to what end? Because the same people, for example, and that project was started, that project started about, it's called Future Prairie Theater, for anybody that's interested, futureprairietheaters.ca. Um, it started about, it started from the idea of equity and, and within, you know, after George Floyd and, and COVID and all of that. It, the same community kept saying, They've asked us this question, what do we want? And we've told them, but we've not seen any change. So, and that's what I'm saying, the over-instrumentalization of participation, it's, it can have its backlash because especially when we're not up, so they've told you something as a researcher or as a community, what are you doing about it? Are you going to go back again and then keep asking them the same question, the same question? So participatory approaches are great, but we have to ask to what end? So what? You know, I told you, don't come back to me again because I'm going to be tired too, right? You know, and all that. So I hope that kind of speaks to that. Um, uh, the last question here, given the, the different forms and levels of participation, how can this be effectively operationalized within different contexts and settings in Canada and Nigeria? Um, and I think I kind of speak a little bit to this is that how I think about participation is right from the get-go, I'm very, you know, whether I'm invited into a project or I conceive the project myself, because we have to, let's be realistic. Uh, there are times that you think about the project yourself. You're like, oh, I think I love this idea. And then you go and say, what do you think about this? And then, and then, and then it becomes something. There are times they come and meet you. For me, you know, I'm of the opinion, and this is my opinion, nobody, me, that it's, it's, we shouldn't be either or. It can be both of them. There's nothing that says that, you know, I'm thinking in your community, in our community, oh, we think about this. All right, what do you think, you know? Or the community says, you know, you're a theater person. Can we do this? Both of them are valid. It's always about how we go about it. But though, at the end of the day, though, is that the way we operationalize it, it starts from how we design it, right from the conceptualization to the operation, to the design, to the execution. And all of that wrapped up in what I call value system. Um, I was just talking to a colleague recently last week and I was asking the person the question, what value, what value do you sit on and what value do you sit in? They're two different things. 
when we talk about participation, we have to think of not just only bringing people together and then we're done. But for me, that's what I'm saying. I, I see people as having the capacity to, as having, you know, everything, Ceteris Paribus that we see in economics, everything being equal. There, I don't think there's anyone that will not want to have a say in their life. Even, even my four and a half year old, you know, daughter would say, dad, no, I don't want that, <laughs> you know. Now, I know that's oversimplified, but if we make it bigger, it means that if everything were equal, people want to have a say in their life, over their life. And so having an external person come and say, let's do it this way, not understanding and putting into consideration that the people have their voice, the people have their way of life, the people have so, so, so many things, not putting that into consideration is a dead end. And so then it's, it's in how we design, what, what value that is guiding the thinking, what value is guiding the conceptualization, the design, and ultimately the execution, and of course, the evaluation. Um, those are some of the questions that we have. And, and, that, and, and what I'm saying cut across, not just Canada, Nigeria, even here in Norway, anywhere we're working, like we need to have, we need, I'm hoping that we can get to that point where we can actually decenter ourselves. And I think that's what the point I'm trying to get at. We need to decenter ourselves, whether you know, we have the power, we have this, we have that, and we are asking ourselves, so what does that mean? You know, for my community, what does that mean for this individual? What does that mean? Does that, does that, you know, promote listening? Does that, you know, put to the forefront dignity and all of those kind of things? And the currency I'm presenting here, though, is not a currency that drives our economy. The currency that drives our economy is the boss, the very capitalistic. But I'm saying, can we can we do a turn and look at some of these things from this other side? And then <clears throat> hopefully that can help us. Thank you for the question um, online. I think that's all. Um, and then I'll come to the room. Any other question that we have? Any thought? It mustn't be a question. I can, it can be a thought. I can also ask you a question. Yes. yes. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, some practical implications, especially, for example, the second project. Yes. How, how did people get involved? How was the information of the people <laughs> who get involved? How did you go about this? We wanted to do something similar here in Norway. What are your uh, tips or, or ways to go about that so that it is also the opportunity to participate in the project? So sort of more about the design and how that can happen. Absolutely. So that, that project, Onion Theater project, I worked with many people and it was intentional that I always play the, my videos to the very end so that you see all the credits because it's not me when I'm talking about it, it's everybody. Um, at that time, I was doing a project with another organization. I met this lady, Jasmine Roger Wonder. She's in Canada, so in case she hears this at some point. Um, so she's shouting up, giving a shout out there. Um, and then she met me, she said, um, she saw the theater project that I did and she was like, could we do something like this? And she was working with a service organization. So what I try to do in my own work is I look for who are the quote and unquote, the main actors. Because for that particular audience and community that I was gonna work with, they were, um, the project was originally designed for newly arrived immigrants. We don't call them refugees again, uh, newly arrived immigrants. So I had to seek them out. I had to go to community organization that are working with them, that are providing service to them. I had to go to also their local community groups because if you, for example, I don't know in Norway, this is an example, maybe Stavanger, you have, you know, if you have a huge population of Syria, Syrian or Ethiopian or Ukrainian, they might have an organized group. So I will go to them. So it's about seeking them out. That's how I actually started. And then when I went to them, then we sat down to say, okay, what do we, what do we want to do? And then we talked about it. And then we wrote a grant. Now, what interesting in that project though is that the first year it was pro bono. I had to, there was no money, but I wanted to do it. So we designed a project hoping that we're going to get funding for the second year. Um, anyway, we did a project. The first year was really, really successful by definition of success, uh, which means that people came to us and say, thank you for doing this. Not about the number of people in the seats. I can tell you how many people saw it, very big numbers, but I'm not interested in that. I'm most interested in 
a professor walking up to me to say, I've been learning, I've been teaching for 15 years in this university, and I never knew why Asian students, particularly Chinese, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, use new names. Like, you see them in Canada, I don't even know where they use Krista, Apple. And like, what's really your name? And, and he was like, he never knew that they had to change, they had to find an English name so that the whites don't, you know, so that the other culture don't feel embarrassed because they couldn't pronounce their name. And he said, now what I'm going to do moving forward is each time I start my class and I see, you know, a student with a name, I can say, what's the story behind your name? That, see, that, that was successes for me, okay? It's not quantified, but that's what it is, okay? So I had to build, I, in terms of my design, I built a strategy around how to gather stories like that. So I'm not just counting the number of seats. So we designed that. And then, of course, we, we did it the first year. And then the second year, we got the funding, which we were able to do all the shooting and all that, because those things are expensive. Um, so it started with me going to them, designing it together. Um, and one thing I do, though, is even though I write a grant, I know this has been recorded. Somebody's going to cut me at some point. It's fine. Um, I write a grant. We submit it. And if I get the money, when I go back to the community, I ask, this is what we wrote in the grant six months ago, because I don't know in Norway, it takes a while to get result of grant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we're on the same board. So I ask them, is this still what you want to do? Because six months ago, many things would have changed. If it's the same thing they want to do, fine, let's do it. But if, say, if they say, you know what, I think there's slight differences. And I'm like, and this is where I need to bring my strategy and my tactic on board to say, okay, then how can we, what do you want to do now, six months later? And a lot of the time in all my projects, even when things they want to do changes, the theme they, they are still talking about is almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it boils down to working with them, designing that. And then I then have to say, do we have the capacity to do that? So in this project where capacity building was very critical, so I had to bring in a person that does spoken words. I had to bring in somebody, so somebody that was needed to learn English. So we had to merge people together to be able to learn English and all of that. And we, somebody was interested in directing a piece. So we had to give them a, a particular skit to say, direct it by yourself. Somebody was interested in building repertoire of, you know, creating music. Like every music you saw there was actually composed by one of the, one of the person in the play. Uh, somebody was interested in doing videography. Like, yeah, do that, you know, because capacity building was critical for them. So... I, for me, it's always going back to say, what, what do you want to do? And how can we use this project as, um, as, a, as a platform to make that happen? It's not successful all the time, but I try my best. I try, I do. Like, I want to make it work. So, so to go back to your question, so is that if we want to do this kind of project, we have to identify who are those that are, that are serving that community already, um, who are those that, um, that are interested um, and, and different things like that. And then we can then create together uh, and then, you know, and then we see, we see what comes out from that. Good question. Okay. Any? Yes, please. Yes. I just thought it was really interesting that you wrote about in your presentation that you use still images to create and develop characters. Hmm. And I just wondered if you could elaborate. Yes, I can. Um, I don't have time. I'll really practicalize it. So you're writing it by image already. So I'm not going to go into you know the detail. I created this three this three arc of image theater. So I pick a particular scenario, a moment in time. And I try to do what happened before, what happened after. So if, if I'm like, oh, that's like maybe the stories that I was surprised. And I say, can we create a story before and the story after? And if I move all of that together, I create a scenario. So I can amplify that to be to me. So that's how I use my still image. So I use, I use a lot of still image to create stuff. And then I now bring it back to life. I animate it back to life. Because a moment in time, many things led to that moment. And many things will follow that moment. So that's how I use, that's, 
one of the ways that I use my still image. So does that answer that question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so what that means is that when I, when I, when I, so from every scene has a character. What, so how I develop the character is if, if this character is shocked at this time, how, what brought them to that point? Who are they? So I start asking the question, who is this character? Who are those that are with them? You know, the social relationship and all of that. And then we can start feeding that into the character. So many things are happening on that. It's, it can be complex. It might take us like an hour or two, if it, just one character, but that's why my work could take a while because I then, we, 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 the whole idea is to build a robust character. Um, and at times it's very flat character, I just do and go. But particularly for a lot of my true line characters, like I need to spend time to really look at what their experience, who are those with them, what their backstory, what's the subtext and all of things like that. So I use that. So, so image data becomes the starting point to open all of that up. Um, I also teach script analysis and, and I'm also a dramaturg, so it's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yes. I just want to only we have five minutes. Five minutes more. Yes, five more minutes. Um, yeah. So, yes, we have five minutes left, but we still have the ability to one last question. One last question or comment or oh, thought. Yeah. I can have a question yes. on behalf of some of my students who are working or in the EMEA course and working with migration. And in those five strands, you had that one that was specifically sort of looking at migration. Yes. What, what do you do and what kind of research do you have in that? So, could, that could be interesting for, for the students. Yeah, so right now, um, so theater and, and immigration, we're specifically looking at belonging, um, identity, I'm trying to remember, expectations. And the project that I'm doing right now that is in that part of that strand is um, at last year, um, an organization in Regina called me um, to, um, to um, create a piece around um, um, the immigrant experience in Regina. And so I ended up creating um, this piece called What's, What's a Name? And I was actually planning to show that, but I just didn't want, I don't have much time today. Um, and so this year, what I'm doing with them is I'm writing a play right now where I am, there is um, a medical doctor back in the day, I think the first black medical doctor in Saskatchewan, and I think on the prairies, I think in Saskatchewan, they've written a, a children's book in honor of that doctor. So now, based on that and based on the work that I did with them the last time, I'm not bringing both of them together into a performance. So the research around that is what two things. One, I'm trying to trace the migratory route, R-O-U-T-E-S. I've written about route and roots and migration. I'm trying to trace that. But the second thing though, is that when people get a particular route, R-O-U-T-S, T-E-S, they form roots there, R-O-O-T, and, and how Strutt has written a lot about that, and we can chat more about that. So I'm trying to, it's, it's, a, it's a pull and push. Like, what does that mean in terms of migratory stories? And how can, how can both of them inform one another? Whether we're talking about equity, we're talking about representation, we're talking about visibility, we're talking about giving, you know, um, providing space for other voices to be heard and different things like that. How does the migratory route um, support or shape migratory route, R-O-O-T? Because when we get, for example, if I immigrate here to, to Norway, I'm from Nigeria, I've spent time in Canada, and if I come to Norway, what I end up coming here, it's not going to be like the the... 100% African. Does that make sense? Because there's, there's an influence already. So the research that I'm doing is around that right now. You know, and they're using storytelling, you know, different art forms to actually bring that to the fore. So that's a research that I'm doing there and I'm happy to chat more about that. Um, but in all of those research clusters, there are multiple research is happening. And again, it's left 
intentionally opened that way as a container so that a lot of content can fit into it. So the fact that that's what I'm working on right now does not mean that other things cannot come in. So um, kind of leave that. Okay. I hope that to answer the question. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I should. So, um, I just did it without asking you if it was okay. Yes. I just put these wonderful uh, sentences back because I, what I love, especially about the way you have hyped the lecture is that you sort of, you're capable to, to, to lift the eyes and say that the important thing is quite clear. Thank you. So that was one of them. And there was also the other one about the acting personally. And yeah, so uh, just, Two examples, um, but that was just two examples. Thank you for a very inspiring lecture. Uh, it was, it was, yes, very inspiring. And I have written down everything I will text you about afterwards. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so uh, much. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.